All right, welcome back to another phenomenal episode of Rants and Gems. My name is Matt Garland, NMLS number 58700, but better known as MG the Mortgage Guy. And my name is Kiana Watson. I am the broker extraordinaire, license number 317576. Look, we're back. We are back. (laughs) We are back. We are here to give you guys some great content. Um, Building blocks is something we've been talking about all year so far, and we're going to keep that theme going, and today we're going to discuss uh, the first-time homebuyers, right? Absolutely. I feel like first-time homebuyers, you really want to be educated about the process because there is so much misinformation on the internet. Mm -hmm. You can Google and you can research things, but what we're going to share with you is from our personal experience. Absolutely. It's going to be information you can use in any state, no matter where you are. Very important. Very important. Very important. Very important. And this is going to help you prepare yourself for home ownership. Look, so pins and pads, people, get them ready, especially if you're a first time home buyer. If you know somebody who's aspiring to be a first time home buyer, share this information with them. And first of all, shout out to everybody that's rocking with us on Instagram, TikTok, all on the podcast audio networks. We appreciate the love, the support, the reviews. Keep liking, sharing, commenting, listening to it on audio. Rate us five stars, leave a review. Oh, yeah. We appreciate that's how you support it's, us. I mean, it's a lot of love. No, like we get a lot, lot of love, love on our episodes. And shout out to our new social media manager. I gotta oh, give it up. Shout out to Chris, man. Like, <laughs> let me tell you, there he has really put together all these amazing clips and Absolutely. we forgot how much valuable information we're putting out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. And now it's just grasping the attention of our audience. So we are grateful that you guys are getting the information. And execute it. Absolutely. You see a lot of executors. Absolutely. A lot of our, our, our community is executing at a high level. And, um, you know, this is why we're doing this. Right? Absolutely. We're both busy professionals, but we want to give back. And this is how and, we give back. And give and give the information because, I mean, information changes the conversation. Absolutely. Information changes <laughs> the conversation. That is a fact. So, look, let's get started with the building blocks, right? First time home buyer, Kiana, where do they start? As a first time home buyer, I am going to be a little biased. I'm a real estate professional and I feel like you want to start with a real estate agent. Okay. And the reason you want to start with a real estate agent is because we're going to be able to explain to you the process, talk to you about different loan types briefly and connect you to the right lender. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's very important as a first time buyer that you at least start with a real estate agent because we have relationships. We have relationships with lenders and different people. We know about different programs. So at least then you're being guided, starting with their agent and guided to the right professionals to get you to this finish line. Agreed. Agreed. I think an agent is probably your best resource Mm -hmm. um, in the marketplace. You know, obviously you want to use Google, do your own due diligence and things of that nature. But having an experienced real estate professional by your side goes a long way. Oh, yeah. And they'll be able to give you the temperature of the market and whatever market you're in. Right. Everything you need to know. I mean, that's the that is the beauty of starting with a real estate agent. They're not going to just tell you it, most of them. They're not supposed to. Mm-hmm. The way I train my agents at Watson Real Estate Co. <laughs> but you have to at least begin with knowing what the market conditions are. Let them get an understanding of what you're looking for. Give you an estimate of what it may take to obtain a property in the market. Mm-hmm. And then talk about, okay, what different types of financing. Because I have a lineup of, of different lenders, but specific lenders may not work for a certain situation. So Absolutely. you get connected to the lender that's going to better sit, fit the needs that you're looking for. I agree with that. Uh, so I think starting with your real estate agent, your real estate professional first, to discuss your wants, your needs, the temperature of the market, Absolutely. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? You definitely want to start there. Now, let's go into preparing your documents because mm-hmm. this is the very most important thing to me, right, as a lender. So I'm a little biased, right, <laughs> when it comes to that, is being organized. A hundred percent. A lot of you guys are not organized. A lot of mm-hmm. you guys are out here, don't know where your W-2s are, your last pay stubs. You don't know what any, anything is. So your documents that you need to get yourself pre-approved are your last two months of bank statements, all pages of your bank statements. And the reason why I'm telling you all pages is because, you know, some bank statements, let's just say it's seven pages, 
They like to yeah. black out. They like, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to get to that too. They definitely do, right? So all pages, right? So sometimes the last page is left bank, blank yeah. on purpose by the bank that you bank with. So sometimes people will send their bank statements missing that page, mm-hmm. but an underwriter still will want to see it because on the bottom it will say page six of seven, and uh-huh. then it's like, where's the last page, right? Although it's blank, we still need it, Agreed. right? So very important, have last two months of bank statements, all pages. Um, if you're a W-2 employee, you need your W-2s, the lender might, for the past two years, um, you need tax returns for the past two years. Now, some lenders might not require tax returns if you're going W-2, so just make sure you check with that lender because you don't want to oversend information that you don't need. Agreed. Right? So you got your last two years, W-2s, tax returns, last 30 days of pay stubs, two months of bank statements, copy of your ID. Um, if you're getting gift funds for your transaction, you want to make sure that you have that in place as well. Absolutely. Um, you want to make sure that whoever is the donor, right, they understand that they have to provide their bank statements as well because that's a big thing when it comes to gifts. Oh, absolutely. You they know? have to prove that the person that's giving you the gift is getting the money from their account. Exactly. So they can't get it from the mattress, you guys. <laughs> like, exactly. And it, and, it, and it can't be you giving mattress money of yours to them and then they deposit it, and then they're going to wire you or give you a check. No, okay. no, 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 no. And I think that's really good for them to be organized. I like to call it like your green file. Like you get uh-huh. all these things ready. You could have it in paper. You can have it online. You can have it in your in just a folder on your laptop. But if you have all these documents, it's easier for you to go through the, the application process. I, absolutely. And what I would recommend is creating yourself a Dropbox or a, oh, Go- yeah. or a Google a Drive. Google Drive or a Dropbox. So that way, if you know you're looking to prepare to buy right now, you can just start uploading everything in, these, in this file yes. right then and there and call it my lender file, right? I like that. You call it your lender file and you have it all there prepared. So that way, when you get the referral from the realtor, all your documentation is right then and there on the spot, mm-hmm. right? They have it right there on the spot, and you can just send the lender the link and give and, them and access. And you can continue to upload additional documents exactly as needed. as needed, right? So those are the main documents that you're going to need. Now, if you're self-employed, obviously, it's a little bit more extra documentation. You're definitely going to need your tax returns for the past two years. Um, you're definitely going to need to have a profit and loss statement, um, depending on the program. And I'm not going to go into too much deep detail yeah, into I this. Feel like that's his, I think that's his own episode. Yeah, honestly, you know what? I think that's a good idea. We Absolutely. should do a full fledged self employed guy. Yes. You know yes. what? We're going to do that for y'all, right? A self employed <laughs> guy. So we can really break that down. Right. So now, but every other doc, obviously, you don't have pay stubs if you, if you are self employed, but if you run a, your business and you pay yourself mm-hmm. um, a salary from your business, then now we need your W tools also and awesome. the pay stubs. Exactly. And also your business tax returns, your P and Ls, if you have K ones, you know, things of that nature. Yes. Right. So you're gonna need all the all that documentation um to get your pre approval process started. And that's at least that's like I know it sounds like a lot to you guys, but that was like step two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was step two. So, you know, you start with one identifying a really good real estate professional and they're going to go over like the steps, right? The bare minimum steps. Yeah. But then consultation. You, yes, it's a the, consultation. The consultation normally up front is like a short consultation because I always say. How long do you think? The first consultation is about 15, 20 minutes because okay. see, I can't really help you. I don't know what I don't know what what we need to discuss until I know what you're approved for. Correct. So that first talk is just really a brief conversation to find out where you are and figure out what lender is going to be the best connect for you. Okay. Then when you go to the lender and you submit all your documents, as MG said, then you come back and now you come back. You have a pre approval in your hand, yep. and now we're ready to discuss you buying a home. Absolutely. You you really it's like it's like window shopping. You can you may like wandering through the mall trying to figure out, you know, what you like, but buying a house is not like that. You want to know exactly what you qualify for so we can discuss the type of properties that's going to fit your budget. Uh-huh. So the biggest thing I always tell my clients is now that you come back and now you have this mortgage approval, this is the third step that I think is very important that you get from your real estate professional. This is that detailed consultation 
We got, we have it. And the first thing I, I'm not afraid to ask the question, thank you for your approval. Now, how much money do you have saved to purchase this asset? Do you have enough money saved to cover your down payment and your closing costs? I want to know this because we, we're going to get to that next step. Now I know how much money you have saved dedicated to purchase this asset. That's a really big question. And then from there, if you're approved for 700000 but you only want to spend six fifty, great. I'm going to make sure you modify your um, approval letter. Mm-hmm. And I want to know this information so I can send you properties within the budget you want to keep. Yeah. Then I normally like to take it a step further. What areas you want to be in, what type of home interests you, how many bedrooms. And so once I get all that information, I love to, if, if we're at a Zoom meeting, I'll share a screen. If we're in front of each other, I'll show you on screen. Let's look at the data. Because a lot of you guys get misinformation from anywhere. So if you're looking in a specific city, I'm going to show you what that specific city average price point is, Mm -hmm. what the average sales are, if the sellers are contributing to closing in this area, how long is a property sitting on the market. That's how you can make an informed decision and come up with a strategy. There's a strategy to identify, look at property and place offers. Absolutely. I'm glad you just said that. Place and offers because that is one of the... uh, T- most difficult things right now oh, in, yes. in our industry there's thousands of offers going out on homes daily right now in the Absolutely. marketplace and every house has multiple bids and everything like that so one thing and i know you get this a lot from first time home buyers is they're getting discouraged right yes how do how do they in 2022 make their offers competitive especially being a first time home buyer cuz they're probably putting down a minimum down payment also, mm-hmm. right? So how do they make that offer a little bit more competitive right now? It, I'm, and I'm going to say this because it's not like a blanket answer, but let's just say you are looking in mm-hmm. a competitive space. You want to have an agent that's going to structure your offer and make sure it's presented well. All the documents are filled out. You want to have short contingencies. What are contingencies, right? Mm-hmm. When you buy a house, it's contingent upon having an appraisal. It's contingent upon you passing your financing. So let's say you get you get with the lender and they do all the work up front. You don't need 21 days in a financing contingency. Mm-hmm. If they've done the work up front, you maybe you can do a seven-day or a five-day financing contingency. So now the shorter that contingency is, the more attractive it is to the seller because every time you hear the word contingency as a buyer, think of a contingency as that's your out, right? Yeah. A contingency is your way out of the contract. To make, be more attractive to the seller, you want to have minimum contingencies and shorter timelines on the on your way out of the contract, right? Correct. So, and let's talk about the next part. You have the appraisal. Let's talk about the, let's break down the contingencies. Okay, so them, right? a contingency, the different types of contingencies. So, so the first contingency is going to be, typically it's like your due diligence contingency or your mm-hmm. right to inspect the property. Most states have this and you either pay option money depending on your state Option money gives is money that you pay directly to the seller so you can inspect the property. Now, we do not enforce option money in Georgia, but I do know that North Carolina, Baltimore, and a couple of other states enforce option money. Okay. So you have to pay to inspect. Either or, that's your period of time to get your home inspection and negotiate any repairs with the seller. Okay? Mm-hmm. So you have that contingency there because you always want to get a home inspection no matter what. And that's the due diligence. That is your due diligence phase. Okay. And that is a contingency of the contract. Correct. So now you make it past the due diligence phase, and now we're looking into the next, which is typically the appraisal and financing. It depends on the financing type, right? Mm-hmm. But let's just say for all purposes, we're going to start with a financing contingency. That okay. is a certain period of time that the letter has to give a letter of commitment to the other side stating that they are going to fund the loan. Correct. So a lot of people get it mixed up because they're like, well, I got approved. Good step. Step (laughs) one. But to get a letter of commitment, the lender needs a copy of a binding contract, a binding real estate contract. Then they submit your paperwork. Then they rewrite your file. Then they can say you can purchase this property. Correct. So the sooner you can eliminate that, the better. A great mortgage lender would have done so much work that it wouldn't take so long to do that part. Correct. Some lenders don't. Some lenders would just do a look-see, like I call them, look at your credit, look at your assets, give you the approval letter, and they don't start working until they get the contract. Mm -hmm. And that leaves room for error with the financing contingency, and you will never be competitive. Correct. They'll need 21 days when you really want to do 
10 days, seven days, the least amount of days you can. Mm -hmm. So now we've gotten past that. Then you have the appraisal contingency. Now be mindful, depending on your financing, if you have an, a VA loan or an FHA loan, you don't have an appraisal contingency. You have what is called the amendatory clause. Mm. That amendatory clause states that even if this home appraises $1 below the purchase price, you as the buyer have a right to terminate the contract and get your money back. Correct. So you don't have a time limit to get your appraisal. You can get the appraisal the day before closing, actually. There's no time limit with the VA and FHA. However, with conventional financing, there is a time limit. They have a specific time to provide a pr appraisal report. Now, they don't have to share the appraisal with the seller unless you're asking them to reduce the price. Mm -hmm. So let's just make it simple. If you're buying a home for $300,000 and it appraises at $295,000 mm -hmm. and you're going to ask the seller to reduce the price, you're going to give the seller a copy of your appraisal and submit the correct amendment to the contract to reduce the purchase price then you can reduce the price or they can have the option to reduce the price. Now, let me give you another example. You're buying a $300,000 house and it appraises at $315,000. That's your business. You got $15,000 in equity. Mm -hmm. You don't have to share that with the seller. You can just move past that contingency and move forward with the next phase of the contract. Look, the and that's the FHA... A mandatory clause is probably one of the biggest hurdles or one of the biggest things that are hurting home buyers right now mm -hmm. because knowledgeable agents who understand FHA and VA financing, they know about the mandatory clauses and they know how it works. Right. They don't want to accept those offers right now because of everything that you just mentioned. And it's and it's really hard to and the hardest thing about that is we want to advocate for home buyers, right? Absolutely. And for first time home buyers. But there are specific properties in certain areas where you're competing against cash buyers, you're competing against people that are financing with conventional, where your offer may not just just may not be as attractive. And the only thing you can do is maybe try to offer more money, like offer above asking price and hope that they take it. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't have to reduce your contingencies because you're protected by the contract. And I've seen a lot of agents try this. Like you try to override the amendatory clause by saying, well, if this home does not appraise at this value, then my client will pay this dollar amount between the difference. Yep. It's an amazing special stipulation, but it works best for conventional finance. Yeah. And that's a great strategy. It's a, it's a great strategy. Yeah. But that strategy is not the best strategy for the amendatory clause because now exactly. you're adding a special stipulation to a contract that is conflicting with what is already pre-written in this, your legal right. So what I would suggest you do is if you cannot finance conventional and you have to finance FHA, you have to come in strong. Like don't even yeah. ask for any closing costs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Try to close as fast as you can. Um, don't get caught up, like due diligence, have a due diligence where it's like a three day or four day due diligence. Don't complain about every little thing. Um, but there's no cleaner way to put it because we know most sellers, and they're selling to make a profit, and they want the sm the fastest and the smoothest sale. But as long as you know how the mandatory clause works, I can tell you, even today, one of my sellers, we accepted an FHA offer. Mm -hmm. And we had previous offers that were conventional. One deal fell apart. The other bill, deal, they went under contract. The very next day, they, they decided to walk. And it's a property that would be a great investment property. But the reason why I convinced my client to go with the FHA client, I said, listen, everybody else is here to try to invest this property, turn it into Airbnb, flip it. But this is a family. Yeah. yeah. And more likely they're going to buy this house. They're going to stay in this house. So they're going to follow this process through to the end. So as long as you have an agent that understands how to advocate for you and I'm advocating for you and I'm representing the seller. Yeah. You know, but you know what, though? I think that's a key point. Identifying the market and what the company competition is right Absolutely. so if you're buying a house like you said it's in a hot spot it's investors the airbnb that can be a win for you correct like hey pull on the hearts exactly of, of the sellers right well, sometimes <laughs> it's about pulling on the heartstrings of the sellers yeah. making sure you present the offer with that whole kind of like overview of what we're offering who my people are who are these buyers what does this house mean to them mm -hmm. what are some features that they enjoyed in the house 
you know, really make, because there are some sellers that really want to sell their home to a, a family. family. Yeah. Like they don't want investors. Yeah. And so you really want to just kind of take the time as an agent, find an agent that's going to take the time to represent you well. That's the biggest, that's the biggest ma- ma- major, major key. They're not treating you like another number. Absolutely. Like and even, 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 even your, your lender, whoever you choose to be your loan officer, oh, yeah. everybody in your team needs to treat you like your VIP period and, point and, blank. And actually that's the teamwork of it. Yeah. Like, have someone that really understands you and they're advocating your best interest. 100%. Because FHA has its own hurdle, but you can still buy a house. No, nah, 100%. Look, yes. I do a lot of FHA business. Mm-hmm. Is it a little bit more difficult now than it's ever been? Absolutely. Agreed. 100%. This is the most difficult time in my entire 19-year, almost 20-year career in this business for FHA, VA, low-down payment oh, yeah. buyers, even low-down payment conventional buyers Oh yeah, are going through the motions as well. Um, but I think that was great that we broke down the contingencies because a lot of people just doesn't they don't understand yes. what's in the contract. And I mean, I, and I am, you know, I'm never here to speak ill will of anybody in our industry or any other realtors. But I have represented listings mm-hmm. and I have said, listen, we got 15 offers and I will get an agent send me over a contract with a 14 day due diligence and a 26 day financing <laughs> contingency. And I'm like. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. You're competing against 15 other offers. Is this the best you can do? Which I know if you have a great lender, they can do better. So make sure your your agent is paying attention to that because sometimes we get caught up in just writing the offer as you think it's supposed to be written yeah, and not paying attention to the fact if you're going to write a competing offer, what guarantees can you make to the seller in order for you to win that offer? 100%. Also, you need to make sure you when you're doing those um, contingency dates and everything like that, you have to make sure your lender can actually deliver 100%. whatever whatever you put in there. So if you're going to put a seven day loan commitment or mortgage contingency, um, and that's a, we got to break down mortgage contingencies too. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're going to have a seven day and your your lender's underwriting turnaround time is five days, you're cutting it too close. It's way too close. It's way too close, it's right? It's way too close. Like, you, you're you not guaranteed to go, and we're going to go through um, underwriting and everything in a few minutes, but you're not guaranteed to get your approval Absolutely. in and time. Then, and then you don't want that because now you're already, like, most sellers, you give them a date, they kind of want to stick to that date. <laughs> like, and, and dates are important in st- certain states, right? Oh, yeah. Florida, Georgia, uh, Texas, mm-hmm. these are drop-dead states. Oh, I if know. If that closing date says... March 1st, 2022, mm-hmm. 5 p.m. at X, Y, and Z's <laughs> office. Let me tell you. He learned. He learned from his Let experience. me tell you, yo. <laughs> and we go through this shit all the time. But these damn sellers don't care. No. They are vicious and out of control right now. No, they just don't care. It's like, what's an extra week, B? <laughs> you know what I'm and you in you, your mind is like it's just an extra. It's week, just a week, but it just it becomes a thing. It becomes a big thing, especially yes. here in Georgia. Agreed. I speak for my state, Georgia. These dates, they every date matters. Like I'm to the point that as soon as my client gets approved, I'm gonna give a tip. This is a tip for you if you are an agent, or a tip for you if you're if you are shopping for an agent. The first thing I do is I make the lender send me over a good faith estimate, and I need to know. What is your timeline? How soon can you close? How long is your financing contingency? How long is your appraisal? How much is the appraisal? How much is it to get a rush on the appraisal? Mm. And on average, are your homes appraising at value using the company that your mortgage servicer is attached to? I ask all those questions. And then I add it to the file. Now we know every time we write an offer, this is what we can expect. Absolutely. I think that's a, a gem right there. Put gem in the comments, y'all, because that was definitely a gem. You got to have it all break, broken down. Oh, and, yes. and you as the buyer, you need to know this information as well. 100%. Right. So now you make your offer. You understand. your. Oh, let's talk mortgage contingencies. Let's break that down. This mortgage contingency is, is something serious. <laughs> yeah. And let me tell you why. Because you are approved for the property. But let's just say within this time period, things can happen. A huge debt can show up on your credit report. Mm-hmm. You know, or you could have just went out and bought you a Ferrari. Who knows? It like, happens. Things, things happen. It, it happens. But within that financing contingency, you can get a refund of your earnest money because the lender has not committed themselves to the loan. Mm-hmm. 
So in order for them to go through that, that, that actual contingency, the mortgage contingency, your lender is going to put your file through underwriting and they're typically going to get a conditional approval. Correct. And they're going to have a letter of commitment saying that this lender is committed to financing and backing this loan. And it's within a certain time period. So if you have 21 days on that 21 day, you want to get that letter of commitment. Let's just say for some reason the lender misses that date. Mm -hmm. And on the 22nd date, he finds out that you bought a Ferrari. Guess what? You will be denied for the loan and you will also lose your earnest money as well. Absolutely. Especially because you didn't extend that mortgage contingency exactly. with the seller. Exactly. Right? So if you know that you're running behind, you need to extend it a week prior, five 100%. days prior. You don't want to wait till the 21st and then you call on everybody on the 21st saying this. You should have had that call made by the 15th or 16th. And even you know beyond I mean? that, they need to communicate with their lender. A lot oftentimes you guys know you're in the middle of some stuff. Something's happened, you know, uh, something showing up on your credit or, you know, something's coming. You co-sign mm-hmm. for your mama's car. Like there's things that you didn't disclose and the lender cannot protect you if you don't tell them because it's going to show up. Yeah. Everything comes out in the wash. Everything comes out. <laughs> <laughs> What's done in the dark will come to the light. Correct. correct. As, at some point in life. Right. So now you guys understand the contingencies. You made your offer. You signed your contract. You gave your earnest money deposit. Great. Now, when you give that money, that earnest money deposit, a thousand, five thousand, twenty thousand, whatever it is, make a copy of the check, right? Yes. Because now when you give the lender the um, contract, we need a copy of the down payment check. Now, let me tell you guys, this is very important. Please stop using mattress money. I knew you were for say that. <laughs> your earnest money because now we can't use that, right? Because we can't document where that money came from. So always use the money that use the accounts that you're giving the lender, right? And use the earnest money from that account because now we can paper trail it and see where that money came from. Very, very important. If you use another bank account that we don't have, now guess what? We need that bank account. Uh And if you got large deposits, cash deposits, this, that and going on, now you create a more of a headache for yourself Agreed. when now you're going into underwriting. So let's discuss that part. Now, you give all this information to your loan officer. Now, the loan officer is going to put your package together and they're going to issue you loan disclosures. Now, the loan disclosures initially are all initial documentations. There's nothing legally binding in these in this package, right? So, you can honestly sign this paperwork with the lender and if you feel as if their timeline and everything is not where you need to be, you need to get another lender. You can fire them with no problem, right? Mm -hmm. But again, make sure your dates and everything line up, right? Because you don't want to put yourself behind an eight ball, you know, firing somebody and yet now your clock is still ticking because that happens a lot too. I want to interject in that too. You guys have to realize, and I think that it's very important, like I'm here to advocate for the service industry. Just call me the service industry advocate. Hmm. Once, Once you have decided to work with a lender, And the moment you think you want to change your mind and you're in the beginning of your contract, please stop trying to see if you can work with two and three lenders at a time. Do you understand that they get compensated for the work that they do once you close on the property? They're not getting paid per hour. So it's an abuse of the service industry to shop with three different lenders at one time. And what I mean by that is it's okay to shop around, but once you're under contract, you have to choose. Yeah. Who gave you? So yeah. you, when you do your initial mortgage shopping before you're under contract, so that's that I shot with this person, that yeah. person, that person. Yeah. They told me this is the rate they could get me this one, this one, this one, and this is their fees. When you get a binding agreement, you got to choose one person. The amount of work it takes to churn out this contract, get it in underwriting, get your assistant to process it, get the processor on top of it. It's just really like being mindful that it's not fair to the service industry when you guys do that because you have three people doing the same job and they're putting in the work, but two of them, they're not going to get compensated ever. I 1000% agree with everything you just said. And this is why I look when realtors and loan officers have become a little hard now, right? It's for a reason. 
Yeah. Right. It's when we start setting certain boundaries and this, that and the third. And it's because we've been burnt so many times burnt working up. with people doing this and that and the third. And then deal is they don't do the deal with you. And it's like, what the hell? Why did I go through all of this? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. It's painful, especially it's if you're new in the business. Oh, yeah. Like this is your livelihood, too. And yeah. And look, you have every reason to hire and fire anyone you choose, people. We're not saying that. Right. But make sure be solid. Be decent. Be that's, decent. I think that's what I'm, I'm saying. Yeah. More or less, just be decent and yeah. be solid. Like go with the processes. Understand. Like I'm me and Matt. This is this is my people, and we do when we do a deal together. I try my best not to bother Matt. I go through his processes. This is who I contact for this. I say, True. who do I contact? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, I understand that he is the CEO of his business, and I don't expect to talk to him unless there's an issue. If it was an issue, I'm picking up the phone. That's a fact. <laughs> and then, when it's about to go left, but up, up until yeah, that's then, a fact. I trust his team to do their job. And I think oftentimes when people see us as loan officers or as agents, they like, oh, it's just that person. It's yeah. like, no, I got an assistant. Yeah. I got a client care manager. I got this home buying guide. I have a pre recorded video. I got all these processes to explain everything to you where maybe every single call may not be with me, but it's with a trusted team member. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's adding respect to it because be, real estate never sleeps. Absolutely. It and never I, stops. And, and I think that's important that you're saying that too. Yeah. It, ne- it never stops. And so at some point we also got to, if we have, if it's seven days a week that this business is going, we got to put other people in place so we can rest, relax, spend time with our families. And so maybe we're not available 24 hours, seven days a week, but we have processes and systems in place that's going to still push the needle forward and get you to the closing table. hundred percent, hundred percent. So with that being said, now you have your loan officer, they're going to give you loan disclosures. Again, preliminary documentation, review it. Um, you're going to have your loan estimate there. The lender and you can now make the decision if you want to lock in your interest rate. And this is very important. Go ahead. You're skimming over loan disclosures. Okay, so we let's talk break, about just it. Just break down so some, some of the key things they should look for on the loan disclosure document. Honestly, the initial documentation, the key thing is you want to look at the actual 1003. The 1003 is the actual loan application. Okay. And look to see if there's any errors, right? Because sometimes, even from a data entry perspective, sometimes people put their wrong social security number in, something's misspelled, uh-huh. you know, things of that nature. So review the loan application thoroughly. It's only like four or five pages. Good. Just make sure all your pertinent information that you need for yourself is is correct, right? Mm-hmm. Second thing I would say you want to pay attention to, obviously, is the loan estimate, right? Because this is showing you your interest rate and the cost. Now, please understand, in the beginning of the process, no lender controls the closing costs. Because people always say, well, this lender closing cost was cheaper than this lender. That's because you guys don't really understand the business yet. Oh, the lender this. only controls... <laughs> <laughs> the lender, like, <laughs> brace yourself <laughs> for an epic rant. <laughs> I just, I I just heard that shit in my head. <laughs> so look, lenders only control two things: rate and origination fees. Block A on page two of your loan estimate, top left corner. <laughs> right, that's it. Mm-hmm. Origination fees. Discount points, application, underwriting, maybe a processing fee. That stuff is the only thing that the lender controls. Now, processing, application, underwriting fee, those are junk fees, right? But they, they're not going to get waived because lenders have to pay staff to process and underwrite. It's another way how we make money to pay our staff, right? Now, origination fees is when you're basically paying um, that lender to originate your loan. Now, a lot of lenders won't charge you an origination fee. Um, if you're working with a mortgage broker, they'll charge you a, a, a broker fee. Mm-hmm. Um, the max that they can charge you is 2.75% of the loan amount. So um, do your math or whatever, you know, if you want to figure out that number. And then discount points. Now, discount points is very important, especially in today's market where we have rising interest rates, mm-hmm. right? So when you have rising interest rates like it is right now, Margins are thinner for banks on the back end of loans. And this is how we really make our money is all on the back end pause, right? (laughs) So so now as rates rise, 
margin compression starts to happen. So now the rate that probably six months ago would have been no points. Mm -hmm. Now it might come with a point, maybe two points, right? You're buying down your interest rate at this point. Now, if ask your lender for both scenarios, what is the interest rate with no points? What is the interest rate with one point? What is the interest rate with two points? A point is 1% of your loan amount. $100,000 loan amount, $1,000 is the point that you're going to pay to buy down. Now, if you pay a point, it doesn't mean you're dropping your interest rate by 1%. If you pay a, that one more time. If you pay a point, one point discount point, that does not mean you are going to drop your interest rate by one percentage point. Most, it would probably be a quarter to 0.375% lower. So if the rate with no points is 4%, the rate... I mean, with no points is 4%. The rate with uh, one point would probably be 3.7 mm-hmm. or 3.625. It just really depends on the lender, right? Two point might get you to 3.5 to 3.375, de- depending on the lender. Now, points are not the devil, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, it is extra money that you have to pay. But our good old Uncle Sam... Mr. The IRS, <laughs> the Alpha Fit Boys, the biggest, the, the biggest, biggest <laughs> the big, the biggest, <laughs> the, the biggest gangsters in the world, really, which is the IRS, right? They recognize discount points as prepaid interest. Right. So what that means on your taxes, you will be able to deduct those discount points. Please speak to your CPA. This is not tax advice. No, it's not. This is not tax advice, but please speak to your CPA about it. But so you get some of that money back is all I'm trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. And over the long scheme of things, your payment is going to be lower. It's going to be lower interest. So it's more savings. So you just got to weigh out that pros and cons of the points and run the numbers with your um, loan officer to see if it makes sense for you to pay discount points. But in this market in 2022, Expect to pay points in this market. It's just, oh, yeah. it's just a half. It's just what it is, right? But now, you go through your points. You figure out if you want to lock in. I recommend locking in right now. Um, and I normally don't lock in me personally till I get a contract. I mean, till I get an appraisal, right? But in this market, where interest rates are rising, we're talking about the Feds are talking about they're going to raise the Fed funds. Quantity easing is going to be start tapering. Rates are going to be in the mid fours at some point. So if you can still grab something below 4% right now, oh, yeah. lock that baby in. Lock, lock it in, in, load. If you got a 30-day closing date, lock it in for 45 days. Oh, yeah. If you got a 45-closing date, lock it in for 60 days because you need that time because that interest rate, once it's locked in, it's only locked in for a certain period of time. And if you don't close before that rate lock expires – then you either have to do one or two things, let it expire or extend it. And if you extend it, you're going to have to pay more fees. Absolutely. Right. So it might cost you a rate extension can cost you a half a point. And what do people do? Because you know what bothers, what scares a lot of my clients mm-hmm. is do I lock now? Do I lock later? Like they like, cause like when you lock, let's say you lock in today is 3.75. But then in a week, it's like now the rates are back down to 3%. Mm-hmm. Like the, the fear of missing out on a rate. Like how do you calm your clients about that? Because I try to calm them down, but I'd be like, look, I could do many things, but a lender I am not. <laughs> let, me <get> you, <laughs> let, me, let me get you back to your expert. <laughs> so look, let me put you on game right now. And I don't think I ever spoke about this. So that was a very good question. Okay. It's called a, flo- a, a float down. Okay. Right. So you can lock in. A lot of lenders will offer this. Even I offer this, but I don't even talk about it. But <laughs> <laughs> but you can do a float down, right? And the float down basically states that um, I'm locking in at three point seven five, and if the market drops, let's just say some lenders will say a quarter point, half a point, whatever it is, then you can float it down. Ooh. But that might cost you extra. And points up front, right? So they may charge you a half a point, one point to lock it in with the float down option. Now, 
The con in that, if, if they do charge a float down fee, mm-hmm. right, then if it doesn't, then you screw. You just wasted money, basically, Whoa. and you can't get a refund. It's going to say, oh, you know what? Since we didn't float it down, can I get my one point back or my half a point back? No, because it's already locked. And once you locked, you're locked. You just locked in. You locked in. So you have to make sure, number one, you're working with a loan officer that understands the market. Yes. Not. I'm not talking about real estate, mom. I'm talking about the back end. I'm talking about yes. secondary marketing. I'm talking about understanding the rates. mortgage-backed securities, 10-year treasuries, understanding those things and how it moves so that way they can have a... It's kind of like we're at stock market, right? We talk about this on Market Mondays all the time. You got to yes. know your charts. You got to know this information. So you need a loan officer who's that experience and has that level of education to be able to tell you, look, we can do the float down because I'm seeing X, Y, and Z patterns. Mm-hmm. This, these reports are coming out in the next economic reports are coming out in the next week or two. It should affect the rates this way. Mm-hmm. So if we do the float down, I think we can win okay. or we can don't even have to lock. I think we should wait to lock. Cause even it's like even buying stocks, right? You know the company's going to go a little bit further. So you know what? Let me not buy at this price. Let me wait if it hits this number and I want to buy it at this price. Okay. So it's the same kind of philosophy. You got to, they just got to watch it or get with a good mortgage servicer that's going to. Who's watching the market? You know, because this, uh, that was a lot that I just said. I know. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? I know. But that (laughs) option is, long story short, the option is there for you to take advantage um, of your rate lock, right? Um, So just speak to your lender if they offer a float down. Option. Okay. So now right. I want to catch y'all up, mm-hmm. right? You started with number one, met with a, a great more, uh, real estate professional. Number two, you got with a really good mortgage um, servicer and they were able to break everything down. Now you're back to your um, real estate professional. They are breaking down the contract and you've gotten your loan disclosure. Yes. So you are under contract right now. And you've gotten your loan disclosure. So you got your disclosures. Now you got everything. Now you go on, you locked in. Now your loan is going into underwriting. The appraisal is being ordered at the same time. The appraiser is going to go out there. Um, the, the appraisal management company will pick from a round robin of appraisers that's approved with the lender. The, that that appraiser will contact Kiana and Watson Realty Co. to set up an inspection date. Right, shameless plug. Shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> well, contact them an inspection date now. Very important because remember we talked about contingency dates, right? It's very important to know the turnaround time oh, yes. for these appraisers. Now, in certain cities where there's a lot of volume, it could be a little mm, longer. ATL Shoddy. It could be a little <laughs> longer to get your appraisals yes. back. The machines can take some time. It don't. It don't happen in, in a day. Oh no! I right? think that, and also as, even as a rush. As that's what I'm saying. As clients, I think at this point you just have to. If you're in a hot market, and right now almost every market in America is a hot market. Absolutely. Um, a lot of people are just paying for the rush appraisal as a way to pay for the appraisal. Yeah. Yeah. Just so it gets picked up. Because again, money moves everything. Absolutely. And we do everything as a rush. Yes. Right? And they still come back. <laughs> <laughs> like it still comes back delayed. But nevertheless, while we're waiting on appraisal, you're in underwriting. Understand you gotta know what's the turnaround time in underwriting. Typical loans, conventional FHA. Mm-hmm. Like I'm forty eight hours, right? Some lenders might be three days. Some lenders might be five days, just depending on their volume mm-hmm. as well, right? But it goes to underwriting. Now the underwriting approves the loan um, with conditions. Yes. You know, it's a conditional approval. And the conditions are basically what's needed, right? It might be updated pay stubs. It might be updated bank statements. It might be exp- a lot of explanation explaining large deposits. It could be numerous of different things, right? It could be one of the, if we don't have title back at that time, if we that don't have the appraisal, yes. like everything. So it could be a lot of different things that can be on this condition list Agreed. that we need to be able to close the loan. Now, if you got a laundry list of items, right? Because there's a lot of underwriters in this industry that will over condition a file and ask mm-hmm. for dumb shit. That you don't need <laughs> And it happens all the time And it, and it's painful But don't fight it Don't argue it Just get it to them Say it one more time Do don't, not fight the underwriter Do not fight the underwriters You're going to lose <laughs> They're going to lose Right Because they don't care about you No The underwriters only care about Protecting the bank 
Period. Point blank. Their job is to protect them. Loan officer's job is to convince them, sell you to the bank to say what this person needs this money. And that's what they're right? doing. They're just selling you to the bank. And this Absolutely. happened to one of my clients before where they just decided they wanted to Google her. There is nothing in the underwriting book that says you got to Google a client Definitely not. to I've try to figure out to who them. they are, or who they're connected to and what they do. But these things happen a lot. So when I tell people, when you're looking to buy a house, Maybe you want to do a clean sweep of your own. Um, yeah. Like do a little clean sweep. Go private. Absolutely. Because people you know, are humans. People are human and, and, and nosy. They, and they're nosy. And they're <laughs> going through saying? all your financials. They're going through this. Like, how is this person making this money? Let me just. Yeah, 100%. What is this? What do they do? And sometimes it could help you or sometimes it can hurt you. So. And it's I not supposed say, to be that it's way. It's not supposed to. But it is reality. I'm trying to give y'all some tips that happen every day. Look, and. and I'm telling you this because I I speak to underwriters every fucking day, right? Yes. It happens. A lot. It happens a lot. So just be mindful of these things, but don't ever try to fight with the underwriters. Get the whatever your loan officer is asking for, you needed to get to them within 48 hours tops. And don't piecemeal things, oh my right? Oh gosh. If you got 10 items, deliver 9 out of 10. And your job is just to prove and I had I have literally had people want to Terminate the contract based on the underwriter. Like the underwriter don't know I have any money. Yeah. I got money. I've been working at this job for three years. Why do they keep asking me that? Yeah. Don't focus on the fact that they're asking. Just, exactly. Just deliver the information. Please. They don't know you. So think of the underwriter. Like I hate to say it, but the underwriter is really the ops. <laughs> they're the ops. They are. Right? The, they are definitely the ops. <laughs> <laughs> the underwriter. They're the ops, and they're on the other side, and they're there to keep you away from the house. And your job is to give them everything they need to take them from an op, get them from the opposing side, and put them on your side. That so is. So give fact. them what they need. Do not fight with the underwriters. <laughs> give them what they need, please. Make our life easy. Yes. Right. Yes. Get them. Get your loan officer everything you need. If they got 10 things, give them all 10. If you don't have, if you have nine out of 10, give them the nine out of 10. So at least they can get that back into underwriting. Cause now once you have the conditions, even if you, you fulfill 10 out of 10 in your eyes, doesn't mean it's going to satisfy the underwriter. Correct. Keep that in mind. And that's what you were just touching on. They keep asking for this, but no, whatever you're giving them is not good enough. Mm-hmm. Right. So just get it back. Because just because you got approved doesn't mean you're going to be cleared to close. The, the name of the game is CTC, ladies and gentlemen. It's the CTC for me. Look, type in chat CTC, please. <laughs> type in chat CTC. Because that is the most important three letters in our business. Oh, absolutely. The the biggest letters ever. <laughs> I may put that on a hat, CTC. CTC, baby. Word. So now you can go back and Fourth and underwriting three, four, five, six times, just depending on the underwrite, depending on what they want to see, blah, blah, blah. The appraisal comes in. Let's hope the appraisal appraise as is, right? So when the appraisal comes back, there's two ways it can come back as is or subject to repairs. If it comes back subject to repairs, that could be an issue. The subject to repairs, I, you know what? If I had to make a choice as a real estate professional, I would, if the house is going to come in below value or if it's going to come in subject to repairs, I'll take the below a value because <laughs> the subject to repairs, it's so subjective. Yeah. And now you have to ask the seller to go out and make these repairs. And now the underwriter, now you have the appraisal that wants to come back and they have to make sure the appraisal is done at, to their standards, mm-hmm. not the standards to which you know that it's supposed to be. Um, but if you do find yourself in that position, what I found to be great is I specifically asked the appraisal, what because they have these vague reports. So exactly what is it that you're looking for? Mm-hmm. What do you want? Can I send you a photo of it when we finish? That way, by the time they come out, it's going to save time because the underwriters, they they hate wasting their time. 100%. So ask more questions if you're representing the buyer and buyers. If your agent is representing you, ask them, are they doing that part for you? Are they doing the due diligence to take it the extra step to get photos and communicate? So make sure it's right because the appraiser, they're not supposed to communicate because, of course, they don't want any, they don't want any, anyone swaying the appraisal. But that's mostly for the listing agent side. You know what I mean? That yeah. you can contact them and ask them questions if you need to. Hundred percent. Now you got the appraisal back. That's situated. The title report comes back. Let's pray it's clean. There's no violations. Uh, 
New York. Look, I'm based in New York, y'all. And let me tell you, these title reports in New York, are all these properties are all messed up. There's always issues. There's always violations. Yeah. There's always people adding dormers and extensions <laughs> to their home without permits. Like, it's always something. So, without a clean title, you can't close. Oh, yeah, you cannot. You can't close. So, yeah. honestly, all the contingencies are out the window at that point if the title needs to get cleaned. Agreed. Right. If the seller needs to do things on their end, guess what? You're not going to close. But then, again, guys, if that happens. Remember, if you locked in... Now you might have to extend your rate because who knows how long it will take uh-huh. to get those issues repaired. Now, once we see it, we'll be able to tell you, yo, this is nothing. This happens all the time. Right. It may take a, a week, right? Mm-hmm. But some things might take a little longer than others. So just make sure that your team is fully aware of all the issues so that way you can move forward accordingly. Right? So now you get that title. It's reviewed, cleared by the bank. Appraisal reviewed, cleared by the bank. All your conditions reviewed, cleared by the bank. Excuse me, underwriter. Now you have what we call a CTC. You are cleared to close, and then they will put the loan into the closing department. And then from there, they're going to generate a CD. Well, before you get the clear to close, most lenders will send out a CD. The CD is the closing disclosure. Okay, so in the beginning of the process, you get the loan estimate. At the end of the process, you get the CD, the closing disclosure. Now, this is going to be more accurate than the the loan estimate because the loan estimate was just estimates. Now, this is hardcore numbers. You have your lender fees, your origination fees. You're going to have all the title fees because, again, lenders don't control closing costs. No. All the other fees are all third party. We have nothing to do with it. We have no clue what the fees are going to be when you out here shopping for loans and everything like that. So when I hear you folks say, well, this lender fees are higher than other, the closing cost is higher than other. No, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. It's you got to pay your property taxes. You got to pay. If, oh, yeah. Like you got to pay. Like you got to pay title insurance. You got to pay whatever the title junk fees are. So there's a lot of fees um, comprised into your closing costs, but oh, yeah. your, your CD will have that all those accurate as a, numbers. As a breakdown. As a breakdown. Mm-hmm. And this is pretty much, I would say these are the final, final numbers because CDs does, once you get into the closing now, wow. and, and they start really now breaking down everything between the title company, the closing department, it might increase $1,000, yeah. 1500 just depends. But that's the initial CD won't have the final numbers. The final numbers will probably come a couple of days after you get the clear to close, mm-hmm. and then you get an updated CD with all the final numbers on there. And then congratulations. Congratulations. You, you, you now, you, you now own a house. Yeah, basically. <laughs> right. Because once you get the CD, you know, what you guys see when we're like, oh, we're finally closed or closing day, that day typically is after you've gotten the CD, the mm-hmm. loan officer lender has done their part, and so now you have a final dollar amount that you have to get delivered wired to the closing attorney's office. Now, depending on your state, you may have a closing attorney or you may have a title company. Y'all may all close in one room together. Y'all may all close separately. It depends on your state and it depends on what you do. Typically in our state, we all close in one room. But I do know title companies are in Baltimore, and Mississippi, um, California. Mm-hmm. So again, it just depends on your state. But the day of closing is the day that they are conveying the deed and they're conveying the deed from the current homeowner over to you. Mm-hmm. You are now the new homeowner. Correct. So the conveyance of that deed, the final payment that you make to the attorney or title's office, and when you sit down, what you're signing is all that paperwork that you're signing is all the paperwork you need to sign to convey that deed from the current owner to you. Then you bought a house. We do a little picture. You know, if you're in Atlanta, we like to have action, baby. Take, yeah. take out the camera. Uh, uh, Atlanta is Atlanta. the home <laughs> of the Hollywood realtors, y'all. It's the Hollywood, Hollywood realtors. I have never seen so much production in my life <laughs> except for at in Hollywood, yo. Like, Tyler Perry has definitely influenced these realtors out there. I ain't gonna hold you up, yo. This shit is epic out here, yo. Listen. I wanna buy a house out here just so I Come can have on. a closing video, Listen. yo. Let's, let's do our closing day video. Are we gonna match the fits? But let me tell you, my last closing, guess where they was from? Brooklyn. And guess what she wanted? 
the whole situation. She was like, yes, sis, I want the photo. I Everything. want the matching colors. Let You know, we vibed. It was a great closing. I think that is such a celebratory moment. I'm glad I started implementing that a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, I was doing closings. And I was doing a little bit. And then one day I just was like, let me just hire a photographer. And it was like, let me hire a videographer. And at first it was like, you know, I'm like, I want to document this for me. But then what I realized is really a great documentation for my clients. They get a link to the video, a link yeah. to the closing. They get these pictures and it's a memorable moment. I think anytime you are dealing in real estate and you have a closing, it's worth celebrating. Hundred thousand percent. Now, I want to touch back on something. First, the CD. The CD. Once it's um, sent out, you now you have three days, right? Mm -hmm. It's a three day waiting period before you can set a closing date. So I forgot to mention that. Oh yes. Now, this is very important. Fraud is running rampant all over the world. The scammers are out here, and they are they, they are scamming, super scamming, and they are. Very smart now. Oh, yes. Wire fraud is real, y'all. Mm-hmm. Before you send wire to anybody, confirm the wire instructions with your team. Agreed. Because p- the scammers are emailing people fake wire instructions, looking like official emails from title companies. Oh, yeah. And it's fake and they're scamming. And once you send that wire, is nothing you can do. You'll never get the money You'll back. You'll never get the money back. And if that was your life savings to buy the house, unfortunately, there's nothing that no one can do. What I tell my people to do is you get the wire instructions from the attorney's office and you call the attorney's office to verify those wire instructions. So you take two steps. You're sending a lot of money to close. Take the two steps. Yeah, take the don't. I know you're excited, but please Mm -hmm. check the wire instructions before you send any money for your real estate closings because. I mean, in the past two to three years, I've seen it more and more and more oh, yes. happening. This is something that's real. So please take that part serious. But this was a dope ass episode. Oh, there was yeah, a lot of information it. on this. It's a one. lot of information, but I, I hope that you guys took notes and got a better. And this was a longer than usual episode that we normally do. No, so, it was. But it was it definitely was but worth it, it. It's just going through the buying process. I think we get excited about it because you know yeah. we we we're, we're transactional. Yeah, we're yeah actually, we are transactional. And, and we do this job, and we have teams, and it was just really good to kind of bear it out to you. So when you see these terms, or if you see these things on social media, or you're researching on your own. You can reference this information and say, okay, that's right. That sounds about right. And when you're shopping for an agent, it's the same thing. That sounds about right. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, look, I hope you guys like this video, this content. Like, share, comment, send it to a first time home buyer. We are here to help you guys in more ways than one. If you're in Georgia, please holler at Watson Real Tico. I'm in 21 states. You see how you trump me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> including yeah, I did, including Georgia, right? Yes. <laughs> including Georgia, but we're here use uh, use our teams as a resource to help you guys on your home buying journey and buying real estate, all right? So we're going to wrap this up. Any final words on this? Um final words are if you are in the market to look for a home, start with a real estate agent, ask questions, do your own research, understand the process. And enjoy the process, right? Enjoy mm-hmm. the process. Home ownership is beautiful. You deserve it for yourself and your family. And we hope, hopefully, you learned a lot during this episode that's going to help you get out here and buy you a home. 1000% agree with everything she just said. And I will add to that and just say expect some pain. Not everything's going to be peaches and cream, mm-hmm. right? There's going to be lemons thrown at you. But when God throws lemons, you got to make lemonade. This will, the process can be stressful. The process could be drawn out. Yes. Right? Expect it. If you expect it already, then you're okay. Right? Yes. Breathe. You'll be all right. Yeah. Right? You'll be okay. You'll be okay. If your loan officer, if your realtors are not panicking, there's absolutely no reason for you to panic, have anxiety, be right. stressed out. Mm-mm. Oh, another tip I want to give. It's another final word. Is don't make changes to your life before you close. Ooh. Don't. Don't buy things, this, that, and the third, run your credit, blah, 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 right? That's the normal. But what I've seen happen a couple times in the last, like, two months is that people start changing addresses to the new addresses and doing all these different things like they own a home, and those deals wind up dying. So now you got to – and three of these deals, like I can remember on top of my head, all died for Mm -hmm. things out of their control. 
And now you have to go back and start reversing things, right? So don't, you know, count your chickens before the eggs hatch. Agreed. Right? You don't, you don't, just because you approve don't mean you're going to closing, right? Ain't Oof. nothing, ain't nothing final until you're at that closing table signing your life away. All right? So that's my, that's my final that word. Was, that's, that's a great final thought. Yeah. You know? Very that's important. That's a great final thought. Very important. All right, y'all. We out of here. Matt Garland, NMLS number 58700, but I'm better known as MG the Mortgage Guy. And my name is Kiana Watson. I am mortgage broker extraordinaire. License number 31765. Mortgage broker extraordinaire? Mortgage broker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, mess me up. All right. <laughs> I just sat here and ran through the whole loan I process. Said, I, I, I thought about that. I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, okay. Excuse us. <laughs> I am Kiana Watson, real estate broker extraordinaire. License number 317576. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Rants and Gems show. The biggest ever. The biggest. Peace. <laughs>